Happy Thursday. I hope you are doing well. I pray that you are doing well. I pray that you and your family are also healthy. I pray that you are staying safe, masking up, backing up, uh, doing everything you can to protect yourself and also other people. Always grateful to be with you all. I hope uh, this finds you having a great day already and that you continue to have a great day. We are in session five of our Bible study series, Living Life from the Inside Out. Uh, that's again, just a catchy way to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that we all want to experience more, the fruit of the Spirit that we want people to experience when they're in our presence. Let's just uh, share in a word of prayer and we will get right into our lesson. And as always, I want to thank our media team. Our uh, handouts are available on the website. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together virtually. We thank you that we have the means to do so. As always, we ask your presence to be amongst us, that your presence be known and sensed, and that we hear from you from your holy word. We ask that you remove any barriers that may prevent us from hearing from you how you want us to apply your word to our lives and how you want your Holy Spirit to be experienced by ourselves and others. We ask that everyone that you want to be a part of this study is a part of it as you see fit and that it is a blessing to us and therefore also a blessing to others. Glorify yourself and edify your people. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Patience. Uh, those who are already on here, I want to ask you, do you believe you are a patient person? And I'll wait a few minutes to see uh, your answers. Are you a patient person? Um, this is something that I know I need to consistently work on. This is um, sometimes I'm good at being patient uh, other times i'm not uh, so this is an area in all of these areas are, are areas that we all need to work on um, that's my first question to open up all right <laughs> please please be honest it's always it's always appropriate to be honest god knows the answer already uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment uh, on your responses directly, um, but that's why I'm smiling and laughing. Uh, I, I know I'm missing being able to uh, hunt and fish as much as uh, I have in the past. That helps my patient. Sometimes when I fish, I don't catch any fish. I just sit there. I'm just sitting there. Also, I was telling uh, Jen last night, we were talking my preference is always when I go fishing to sit in one spot. Uh, I know some spots and I prefer to sit there instead of moving around. Same thing with hunting. You can't do anything when you hunt deer. You have to sit in the same deer stand uh, for hours at a time. I know some people that sit there literally all day. Uh, that's not how we typically approach it, but that uh, over the years I've learned that that has helped my patients as well. Um, so I had to ask that question. Also, I prefer when I'm shoveling snow, uh, like it's going to snow this evening into tomorrow morning. Uh, my preference is to shovel and not to use a snow blower um, because it's exercise and I do take breaks, but it's exercise and it takes time. And so that's the way that I force myself uh, to, to uh, take that time, to force myself to be patient, to force myself uh, to, to slow down and force myself to disconnect. I try to leave my phone in the house or in the truck. Uh, we, have to, we have to unplug. And I bring that up because uh, technology does not help us to be patient. If we're honest, we know we have our phones, for example. If we try to pull up our browser or to search something or we try to open an app and it doesn't work immediately, we typically are going to close that app and open it again, sometimes several times. Uh, sometimes we're going to get upset and ask what's wrong with the Wi-Fi, 
you're going if we live in a house with somebody we're going to ask if they paid the bill and, you know we might not ask it nicely if they paid the bill uh, if we if we start to search something and the page isn't loading quickly you know we turn on the TV and something's wrong we know how we respond in those situations uh, we also know if another person is not moving at the speed uh, that we like uh, sometimes how we respond in those ways and so um, I asked that question at the beginning again to see if if we will be honest about uh, our patience and again it's not a bad thing uh, to acknowledge that we are not the most patient person that we're not the most patient uh, with technology we're not the most patient uh, in, in whatever way that it is because if we acknowledge it uh, that's the first step to experiencing it more being intentional about cultivating uh, this part of the fruit of the spirit uh, and also experience and also experiencing in other people more importantly experience that's the first step when we look at uh, other elements of, of hindrances to patients now I would say the comment section on certain posts and articles uh, YouTube videos we have to be careful about going in those comment sections uh, we know that, that if we read an article uh, we see a video that sometimes people may say uh, that they may not be nice and gracious in that comment section and then the responses to the comments can be uh, somewhat interesting as well so we have to know whether or not it's a good time for us to go in the comment section not only can that affect our patients but we can then spend a lot of time in that comment section a lot of time on social media so on and so forth and then a connection to that later on can be an impact to our patients for various reasons and so we have to be intentional about knowing you know today is not the best day for me to uh, look into the comment section i'm already feeling some kind of way uh, let me not go into the comment section maybe i'll come back to it later on and read the comments or, or something of that nature you know especially if it's somebody we know if it's their video if it's their article you know and and somebody may say something that's not encouraging somebody may say something to the left and we know us i mean we think about peter and we're going to look at something that peter wrote in reference to patience which is fascinating because when they were in the garden of gethsemane and those soldiers came to arrest jesus peter was not patient peter was strapped and peter pulled out his blade and he said, uh-uh, not my Jesus, and got to slicing and dicing. And there's not a patient response. But we see later on that P Peter realized that patience is a better response. It's a more faithful response. It's a godly response. It's a Jesus-like response. And that's where you and I want to get. And not only do we want to get there, because I believe all of us that are gathered here so far and that will watch this, we have moments of patience already, but what we seek is a consistency of patience, to be patient all, the, patient all the time. But that's another area we can do. And then we have this issue nowadays with people wanting to be the first to share something on social media. They want to be the first one to send the text. They want to be the first one to communicate, and that's not always a good thing. And one example is when people transition. And I went to a visitation on yesterday, uh, speaking with someone, and they told me they had not been on social media since their loved one had passed because they just didn't want to go on there and see certain things. And it's unfortunate that that is the reality in which we live, that we have to be careful. I remember, you know, a year, around a year ago is when uh, Kobe and his daughter passed away. And I remember being upset and offended at how TMZ handled reporting his death and then some of the other news outlets and some of the details of the helicopter crash and his wife and the rest of Kobe's family had not been told that they had passed. But we live in a culture in which some news outlets are more, um, are more pressed, not necessarily just to report the news, but to report it so quickly that there's not a consideration of how that's going to impact people. And you and I have to be sensitive to that too. 
we know something, we may want someone to know, but before we press send, before we press post, before we make that phone call, uh, we should be patient and think, uh, is this the best way, is this the right time to communicate whatever it is we're going to communicate? It's not wrong to want to communicate it, uh, but we do have to give some, some consideration, is this the best time and the best means to do so, or should other people do that? There are people that we're like family with and we find something out and, and we should try to uh, be patient and let the actual blood family, the blood relatives communicate it first. That's an element of patience uh, that, that I have seen that has been prevalent and I wish uh, that we would as a, as a community and as a culture uh, that we would give people that space to have that communication. That's just one example. So those are just some examples of hindrances. If you have others that, that you know uh, of some hindrances to patients, um, please put those in the comments section. I guarantee you there are others of us that that would be helpful. You all know my, uh, my teaching style, my pedagogy. I believe all of us have as much to offer as the other person. All of us have a relationship with God. All of us are seeking to have a better relationship with God. All of us have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us, so we all have something to offer. So if there are other hindrances to patience, uh, please post them in the comments. Also, um, I invite you, if there are questions that you have, please post them in there. If I see them, I'll answer them. If not, I can go back later and respond in the comments section. I'd be happy to, to entertain any questions. Um, Yes, yeah, so here are some definitions of patience. And I'm going to say something about patience with elders, but I'm also going to say something about uh, elders having patience with the young people. Um, um, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But here are some, some definitions. You see that the top of our handout for patience, a few uh, definitions and observations about patience. Patience is the ability to endure for a long time whatever opposition and suffering may come our way. Again, the ability to endure for a long time, whatever opposition and suffering may come our way. And we're going to get into um, evidence of this biblically in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, as well as the patience of Jesus himself and then how we can be patient as Christians. Number two, patience is to show perseverance without wanting retaliation or revenge. Um, again, to show perseverance without wanting retaliation or revenge. We know that scripture that God says that vengeance is his, uh, but you and I have the, the desire at times to get our own revenge, to get our own vengeance, to see people uh, acknowledge that we were right and they were wrong, to see people suffer for uh, how they may have treated us or how they treated uh, communities of people and so on and so forth. But that's an example, and we'll see this in the, in the Bible in a few moments, the, to show perseverance without wanting retaliation or revenge. Patience is also the ability to put up with the weaknesses and shortcomings of others, including other believers, including other Christians. I would even say especially other Christians because other Christians, uh, we know better, but we don't always do better. But the ability to put up with the weaknesses and shortcomings of others while remembering our own weaknesses and shortcomings, showing restraint without getting, getting quickly irritated or angry enough to want to react. Listen, all of us have weaknesses. All of us have shortcomings. One way that we are going to be patient is that instead of us just jumping on people and jumping down their throat for their shortcomings and weaknesses is remembering that we have them. Even people who are not giving any attention to their weaknesses or shortcomings. Even people who are not acknowledging that they have weaknesses or shortcomings. One of the ways that God can and will mature us is that we won't stoop low, we'll go high, as Michelle Obama said. When people go low, we will still go high. That's an element of patience. Again, now that is not to say uh, we should completely ignore and pretend that the issue does not exist. But a part of patience is knowing that if God wants us to be the person to address that situation in love, you know, love we talked about in a previous session, that is 
God will let us know when and how and give us the words and the wisdom to address those weaknesses and shortcomings. But there are moments that may be apparent that that's going on. That may not be the time to address it. This is, that's also an element of patience. So we see and know some of the weaknesses and shortcomings of other people. The way we can respond to that patiently is knowing, you know what? I have weaknesses. I have shortcomings. I have stuff that people uh, put up with and that I, I don't always do what I should do when I should do it. That will help us. Uh, but we also have to remember that, um, that, that when people have those, we may or may not be the person God chooses to address that with. I've even been in situations where people will do something it is a weakness or shortcoming, and later on they'll come back and they'll apologize, realizing that that was not the way that they should have, have, have done that. I've done that with other people and as well, that God, God's self will say, you know what, you know better than that. That was the wrong way to do that. You need to work on that. And a part of us doing that is then going back to uh, going back to, to issue that apology, to acknowledge that we need to work on whatever that is. That's an element of patience. And so that, that's one way we do it is, again, we, we put up with other people's weaknesses and shortcomings, remembering that we have weaknesses and shortcomings. And then we have some restraint without getting quickly irritated or angry enough to want to react. And again, this takes time to learn, for us to learn how to do it. And it's always going to be and ongoing practice. Number four, it is a generous willingness to try to understand the people or events that God allows to enter our lives. A generous, we talked about generosity a few uh, Sundays ago, and generosity is not just with finances. Generosity is, is broad and global, and it kind of touches every area of our lives, but a generous willingness to try to understand the people or events that God allows to enter our lives. We listen to people. Uh, we, we pray for people. And in listening to people, praying for people, doing that continuously, there will be times where we will be able to discern what people are really saying uh, when they're expressing themselves and they're lashing out. And people could be mad at something or someone else and take it out on us. Being patient does involve understanding they're not really mad at me. They're not really mad at what I just did. They know what I did really isn't a big deal, but they're dealing with some other stuff. And we can see that with some of the ways that this pandemic is impacting mental health and relationships and, and all of that, that people um, are, are dealing with some stuff. And unfortunately, there are times where we take out what we're going through on the people closest to us. And yes, we have to go back and, and apologize. But that can help us to remember, you know what? I'm dealing with some stuff too. I, I, I need to remember that they're dealing with some stuff and not to take it personally. Now, again, as I just said a few moments ago, there will come a time where you can say, you know, I know what you're dealing with, but I also didn't appreciate how you said that to me and when you said it. What can I do to help help facilitate this so that it, it gets better? And, and again, we don't ignore what happened and we don't pretend that what happened may have been wrong, but an element of patience is remembering that just like we have challenges, weaknesses, and shortcomings, uh, other people do too, and we try to work together. We try to work with people. We have those conversations to be helpful, not harmful, and, and that is, as we'll see in detail in a few moments, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't pretend that wrong was right. At the same time, Jesus sought to do what was best, not always what he could have done. Uh, and so you and I, following that example, we seek to do the same thing. You know, generous willingness to try to understand people or events that God allows to enter our lives. And again, we don't want to react, we want to respond. We all, we, I keep saying that over and over. If we keep spending time with God, we keep spending time with God's word, that's what will come out. The fruit of the spirit will come out as opposed to some of this other stuff and other people. Kind of said it jokingly, and it's funny, but it's real. Uh, I have a friend, one of my best friend, he watches Fred Sanford all the time. He watches uh, Sanford and Son all the time. 
And and I like Sanf I like Red Fox as much as the next person. Uh, I like the Jeffersons and all of that. But I know if I'm spending more time with George Jefferson and Red Fox more than I am with the Bible, more than I am with God, then guess who's going to come out when somebody does something wrong or says something sideways to me? George Jefferson and Fred G. Sanford. Uh, on the flip side, Wheezy and Inesta can come out. Okay, you want a more contemporary example? Uh, Cardi B and and uh, Nicki Minaj and and all these other people who um, have some aggressive rap lyrics. If we're listening to them more than we're listening to God, that's who is going to come out uh, at those times. Same thing. Uh, Tupac is my favorite rapper of all time. But if I'm listening more to Tupac than I am listening to God, I'm listening more to all of these little babies and the babies and all these other people and some of the things that are in their song, if I'm spending more time listening to that uh, than I am listening to God, then, then I know what's going to come out. Because everything that goes in our eyes, our ears, and our mouth, everything that goes in is going to come out at some point. And, and it will behoove us to spend more time with God, spend more time with Scripture than we do with anything or anyone else because when life happens, we want the right responses, the right things to come out, and that is how that happens. Again, okay? okay, so that that's how we that's how we do that. Now, it's two words that are a piece of patience that we're going to get into in detail at the end of the session. Long suffering is what we'll see in some translations of the Bible when we read the fruit of the spirit. It it won't directly say uh, it won't directly say patience, it may say long suffering. It also may say forbearance, and we'll get into those definitions in a few moments. And then here is the last point we want to make about patience, and it will get right into what the Bible says about it. It demands strength and stamina. Depends on being able to exercise control over our reactions to others, right? If it demands strength and stamina, it's just like our physical bodies. Said this in another session, um, all of us have a six-pack, okay? All of us have a six-pack. Now, do we always see a six-pack? No. Those abdominal muscles are there. The only way we're going to see them is that we are intentional about working those muscles out and over time, then they'll be seen. That's also coupled with not only the exercise, but our dieting. There was an intentional, concerted effort to cultivate and develop those muscles. The same thing goes in our spiritual lives in general. The same thing goes uh, in particular with the fruit of the spirit we're talking about. And the same thing goes with patience. We have to cultivate all of the fruit of the Spirit. We have to cultivate patience. And the way that's cultivated is intentional, concerted effort. Spending time with God, spending time with Scripture, believing Scripture, letting that be the governing book of our lives. As many books as we read, as many books as we love, nothing is going to be as great and as good and best for us as the Bible. That's as individuals, that's as families, that's as communities. Uh, that's as a church, uh, that's as a body of Christ. And again, just as it demands strength and stamina, we have to work that out. It's the same, same situation with our physical bodies and our physical health. We can apply that to our spiritual health. Now, if you saw the post on yesterday, I asked the question, how can we have the patience of God in the Hebrew Bible, also called the Old Testament, and also, how can we have the patience of Jesus that we see in the Gospels? And then as we see as fleshed out in the rest of the New Testament. Well, when we look at the Old Testament, you know, I know some people focus on the wrath of God that we can see. And some of the other juicy stories we have of how God responded in certain situations and how harsh it can be. I know some of you may remember uh, my suggestion when it comes to reading the Bible in its entirety that we start with the Gospel of John, then we read the other Gospels, we read the rest of the New Testament, and then the Old Testament, because there are some interesting images of God that we can read. And if I'm new to the Bible, I'm new to the faith, if I start at Genesis, uh, there could be some major uh, challenges to reading it. Now, and I'll say more about this in Sunday sermon. 
but we always have to be prayerful when we read scripture. Pray before we read scripture, pray while we're reading scripture, pray after we're reading scripture. Pray before we come to church about listening to a sermon. Pray before we come to Bible study about listening to a Bible study to hear it. Uh, and I even apply that to, to my teaching and preaching. I'm not exempt because we know that there are, uh, in some sense, there are some people who are, uh, are playing with scripture and saying what they want to say and then slapping some scripture on it and all of that. But the other piece is we want to make sure we hear what God is saying to us, what God is saying to me uh, in, in preparing this, this lesson and reading it in the preparation may not necessarily be identical to what he's saying to you. And so we want to get what God wants to say to us as individuals, but also uh, communally and corporately what God is wanting to say to us. And so prayer is where we start and we bathe our lives in prayer with every part of our life. And we also, at the end, we also pray again so that we can, we can have everything we need to get everything God wants us to get out of the lessons. So again, we prayerfully read scripture and, and as we do that, we can see that even in the Old Testament, even in the Hebrew Bible, God was patient. Look at Abraham and Sarah. Abraham started out good. He did what God told him to do. He had never heard of the place that God told him to go to. He went there and all of that. But then there were times where Abraham and Sarah, uh, they kind of vacillated on in their obedience. And God never left them. Uh, he told, God told them they were going to have a child. Sarah literally laughed at God. Then when God asked her about it, she lied straight to God that she didn't laugh. It's right there in the, in the story in Genesis. Then they got impatient and figured, you know what? We can help God out. Abraham and, and Hagar can get together and they can have the, the child that God has promised us. Instead of waiting on God to bless them with what he had promised them with and the promised child, they thought they could do, they could help God out. Now, God did bless them with and Hagar with, more importantly, Hagar with Ishmael, uh, but that's not who the promised one that God wanted to send. We also see that God does bless Ishmael and God does not hold Ishmael uh, in the wrong for what the other people did. So it is. It, it was interesting, but God is patient with them. And even in their shortcomings and weaknesses, as we already talked about, we still speak of them favorably for the most part. We, can, we glean from their mistakes, but we glean more than we see in, in the New Testament and Hebrews in particular, that they're written of and spoken of favorably. And thousands of years later, we still speak of them favorably. Look at Exodus 34 and 6 and hear what God says about himself we know this is uh, in the midst of the children of israel he had delivered them from slavery uh, egyptian slavery and took care of them in the wilderness and they kept rebelling doing what they wanted to do they were impatient but god was patient with them in 34 in verse 6 it says and he passed in front of moses i'm looking at the 34 and 6 uh, the lord the lord the compassionate and gracious god slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So we see there in Exodus, God being patient. David is another example of patience. Now, David is known as a man after God's own heart. But look at the full story of David. David was not a good husband. David was not a good father. But David did do some good. David did love God. He made all those mistakes, and he loved God. He did some good things. But we have to look at David all, didn't always do what he needed to do. And David is still known as a, God, a man after God's own heart, and God blessed his son Jesus to be a part of the human lineage of David. David is still looked at. When we look at the flag of Israel today, that star on there is called the Star of David. So again, we see another example. When we see that flag at any time, I'm reminded of how gracious God is and how patient God is. Jonah, you know, we talk about him being in the belly of the well. That's an example. Of, it really was a large fish, according to the text. But God was even patient with Jonah. God was patient with the children of Israel. He was gracious to the children of Israel. 
Jonah knew that and Jonah liked that. But then Jonas showed that he was a racist. When God wanted Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, and this also shows that God has always been concerned about all ethnicities and races. When Jonah was told to go to the city of Nineveh, he tried to run away because he did not want God to be gracious to them. So the first level of patience that God shows in graciousness is that when they threw him off the boat in that storm, God sent the large fish to swallow him and, and take him. That was probably the first submarine of history, but God used that large fish to take him where he needed to go. Then Jonas, Jonah, still being racist, when he got to Nineveh, that's where you see that passage 310 to 44, he has this conversation with God like, why are you being gracious to these people? Why are you showing these people favor? Why are you giving these people an opportunity for salvation? Now, I know, you know, you all may have never done that, but we may know people who have done that. Mad at God about being gracious to everybody, about having favor to everybody. Because God does not have favorites, contrary to some popular theology. God does not have favorites. That word favor in the Bible uh, should always really be termed as grace because God showed all of us grace and mercy. Uh, God loves each and every one of us as if there were just one of us. And that's all the time, every time. We are the apple of God's eye. That's what that means. We are the center of God's attention, each and every one of us. And so Jonah was racist and he didn't like what he did. And yet God was patient with him. God still used him to communicate his word to the people of Nineveh. And hundreds of thousands of people were, uh, he, hundreds of thousands of people looking at the details of the book of Jonah, were saved through God by speaking through the prophet Jonah. Turn with me to Micah chapter 7. I want to read those two verses. Again, we know over and over again uh, that the children of Israel um, were, were vacillating between obedience and disobedience. And, and, and in some sense, that's encouraging. Now, we should not really vacillate between obedience and disobedience. I don't, I don't want anybody to take that the wrong way. Um, but there are times that we do that, and God is patient with us. God continues to love us, continues to operate. God does not move. We move. But thankfully, every time we get ready to go back, God is right there to accept us and to love us. And we even have uh, somewhat of a different way to do that because of the finished work of Christ. But here's what it says in Micah chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? Now, that remnant is about, this is more about communal sin. So even communities have this opportunity to repent and come back to God. He goes on to say, you do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. God is happy to be merciful to us. He is joyful to be merciful to us. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities in the depths of the sea. Now, again, even we see there in the Old Testament, not only that we as individuals, that God is patient with us as individuals, but he's patient with us as a community of people, as a church, as a body of Christ. And we know that people can be saved at any time of life Children, young adults, teenagers, uh, middle age, even senior saints. That at any time we want to come to God, he is grateful and heaven celebrates when anybody comes to God. Hosea chapter 11. Uh, turn over a few pages to Hosea chapter 11. Actually, it's a book before Micah. Uh, no, it's not. Let me find Hosea. I'm getting mixed up with my, my books today. Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, says, When Israel was a child, I loved them, and out of Egypt I called my children. 
But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, that is, to idols, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like no one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. That is, God holds us by the hand. He provides for us. He heals us. He guides us. Even in times when we don't realize that it's him. Even in times where we're not grateful that it's God. Even in times where we give other people more credit. When we give uh, other systems and institutions more credit. And I bring that up because... We use this word and we throw this word out, I believe a little too casual. We use this word that we idolize people or we call celebrities an idol or fashion idol, fashion icon and all of those. And we have to be careful with that because that can be idolatry and that can slip really easy when we say we idolize somebody. That can be, we look at them as more than just an example, but we say we want to be like them. Now, God does give us people to share their wisdom and practical examples of faithfulness. Uh, and, and we can have mentors. I even say we should have mentors. We just have to be careful that they don't become who we really want to be like more than it is us trying to be like Christ. Christ is the only somebody that has been on this planet that has been perfect. And so we have mentors. We have people to share wisdom. We listen to what they did well, maybe they didn't do well, learn from them. But again, we just have to be careful when we use that word, that we're using it with the correct motivation, intent, and not going to that level of them really becoming idol because we know idolatry uh, is a sin and that's something that does, that does. But even in all of that, God is patient. You see some references to Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached for, for decades. And people didn't listen to him. Jeremiah warned people. He admonished people for decades. And people didn't listen to him. And we hear in all of those passages that even though people weren't listening, God was still going to be patient. Number one, because he loved them. And he loves us. And we're going to always, that's a testament to, we're going to always have the information and inspiration to have a right relationship with God. You know, I want to go ahead and say this too. There are people we may be concerned about who may not be in church right now, who may not appear from our vantage point to have a relationship with God and all of that. We continue to pray with people. We prepare to be there with them lovingly and graciously. But if someone has been saved, they sincerely accepted God's offer of salvation. Previously in their life, they are still saved. And God always not only presents opportunity for salvation, but he also always presents an opportunity to be in right relationship with them, to pick up the ball again, if you will, and to continue to cultivate a relationship with him and therefore have healthy relationships with other people as well. And so, again, that Jeremiah passage and even some of those other, there's this communal and personal repentance that's available the communal and personal opportunities for the resumption of the, the relationship with God. That's how patient God is. That's a part of his grace and his mercy that God is patient with you and I. Well, not only is God patient with us as a father, he is to children, as parents are to children. All of us that have children, uh, those of you who have grandchildren, we know that we have to be patient with them. And that should also be a reminder about patience that God is patient with us. That's another way we can look at God as a father, as a good, great father. And those of us who are fathers, that's the first and primary example that we have of being a father. And we see how patient God is with us. And therefore, we can be with other people. We see that in the, in the in Hebrew Bible. You know, that is, that is our Old Testament. But we also see the patience of Jesus. Think about Judas. Also, we'll say more about Judas in Sunday sermon. Jesus knows it, knew everything, always knew everything. So he knew Judas was going to be the one who betrayed him. Judas also 
was the treasurer. So Judas had all had the money. He knew he had all the receipts. He knew who spent money where, and that's why we see in some of those situations when they were talking about uh, how much money it costs to do this or that and how much money people could, could be fed for and this, that, and the third. That was partially Judas keeping them informed about the financial situation of the discipleship in the treasury, okay? Um, so Judas always had the money. Notice Jesus never took the responsibility from him. Judas gave away his responsibility. Judas uh, was not stopped from doing what he needed to do, and that should be a lesson for you and I. We should not force people to do anything. Uh, even on a political scale, we had to be careful that we don't try to start to legislate uh, scripture, legislate a relationship with God. That is then where we can uh, slip into Christianity becoming a religion. Christianity is about having a relationship with God. Religion means it's a set of rules to get to a goal, but we could not live up to the rules. That's why Jesus died for us. That's why Jesus came to live for us. So we have to be careful with that because, uh, and we know in this country that that can happen, and we try to paint people negatively if we don't want to force people to have a law to obey God. If God does not force, then by definition, you and I should not force. Jesus didn't force Judas to do anything. Judas made the choice he made. Jesus allowed him to make the choice. And let me also say this as an aside. We don't know if Judas went to heaven or hell. That is not in the Bible. That is history and tradition, but that is not in the Bible. And so we have to be careful even in that sense that we start to judge other people's lives and say that they lived a life and that they ended up somewhere or the other. I mean, I can even say this. I'm grateful I don't have that much power. I don't want that much power. I'm glad that that's up to God and God alone. We share the gospel. We live the gospel. And, and we hope that other people accept God's offer of salvation but again, we have to make sure that we don't cross those lines, cross that line going past where we should go. That's even patience that can be cultivated for you and I. So Judas was around. Jesus was patient with him. When we look at the rest of the disciples. Not one of them were around when the going got tough. All of them ran and scattered. I know some people say John was there, uh, but that was the beloved disciple. If it was John, John would have said that it was him. Even when we look at the Gospel of John was not written by John. The Gospel of Matthew and Mark was not written by them. They were attributed to them uh, because of who they were. But the details in the text itself do not lend to them being the right. Luke did write Luke, but they did not write those. All 11 of them were gone. None of them were there at the cross when it was that there were some women there at the cross and there was a the beloved disciple that's that's the only thing we know about that disciple we don't know that disciple's name and all of them was gone but when Jesus was resurrected he went to all of them and restored their relationship even Thomas who saw him and didn't believe immediately he didn't condemn him he didn't judge him he said Thomas come here and touch touch my side touch my hands touch my ankles where the nails were so that Thomas could, could believe he needed something extra. And so we should not be even judging in that sense. We should have patience when people need some more validation and proof. As long as that, we should be patient, period. Uh, but there are often times when people want clarity. It's not that they are trying to disprove Christianity or disprove who Jesus is or disprove that scripture is actually the word of God. They need some additional clarity. And we should be patient and non-judgmental even in that sense. We do walk by faith and not by sight. But sometimes people are not where we are. And if we're honest, we're not where we probably should be uh, or where we will be. God has promised to, to complete the process with us. And we do our best to do that. We do our best to be prepared. But there's even patience in that. So Jesus was patient with the 11. And so we should be patient with other people too. And then we even look at some of the other disciples because there were more than, than those 12 or 13. There were a lot of disciples. Uh, Mary, his mother was a disciple and his brothers and sisters that he had, his earthly brothers and sisters. Mary Magdalene and Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Those are just some named ones, but we know when he sent 
the 72 or the 72 out. Okay, those are disciples. And we see many other people that were following him uh, that we discover. And we'll see some of those in particular in the, as we go through the book of Acts who were present with him on earth and continued his mission, that there were more than just those. And Jesus was patient with all of them and how he taught them, how he spent time with them. And after his resurrection and the time, he, the 40 days he spent with them, that was because he had to remind them of some things. That was because he had to restore some relationships and reconcile some relationships. And the same thing happens for you and I because that's why this Bible exists. That's why we've heard some of these stories over and over again. We have to be reminded sometimes about who God is and what God has said. We have to be reminded that scripture is living and active. So there's that page. Look at the trials preceding his death. Think about and remember that Jesus is all powerful. Jesus could have shut that, shut those trials down like that, even quicker than that snap I just did. Jesus could have responded verbally in some kind of in some kind of ways. He could have physically overpowered them. He even told us that when he got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he could have called down hundreds of thousands of angels to take care of business. But Jesus didn't do that. Now, that informs how you and I respond in situations. That informs that we don't respond in violence, not only physical violence, but verbal violence. Jesus, when he was being accused of all of that stuff during those trials, knowing that those trials were illegal, knowing that those trials uh, were illegitimate, Jesus, look how Jesus responded. And that should inform how we respond. Now, I'm not saying uh, that we should be passive. Jesus was not passive. Jesus was meek, and we should not make meekness into something that it is not. Meekness is having that discernment to know when and where it's appropriate to respond, how to respond, and knowing that uh, we may have to be quiet then because later on it's going to be the time to speak. You know, in a legal sense, when we're looking at these trials, we need to get a lawyer who is conversant in the law to be able to be there. That's why we need Christian lawyers and Christian police officers. And not just saying they're Christians, but actually being Christians. The right people in every area of life so that in those moments we had the right person speaking informed and all of that type of... Jesus also knew that that was scripture being fulfilled and what needed to be done. Now, I can say that because if we remember when he went to the temple earlier that week, and he turned over all those tables and he threw stuff this way and that way. The construction of that temple suggests he did that for a couple of hours. So that wasn't just him throwing some stuff over uh, for a few minutes or about 30 minutes based on the size of the temple. And it says that Jesus flipped the tables, right? Jesus himself. Now, he didn't, didn't, didn't sound like anybody helping because I bet whoever was with him, they were surprised that Jesus responded that way. And Jesus never sinned. And so him doing all of that was not wrong. So, again, we have to look at the example of Jesus, read it, study it, and to see how that then informs how we live our lives. We know when to respond. We know how to channel our anger in faithful, positive ways. Because anger in and of itself is not a sin. Jesus got angry right up in there. But what we do with our anger can be a sin. That's even in Ephesians 4, I believe it is. So, in his trials preceding his death, Jesus was patient, and he was, he was prepared, he was grounded, and he was able to respond faithfully. Turn with me to 1 Peter 2, and, and, and this is where I mentioned earlier that, you know, it's interesting that we can get some some, some encouragement and some information and inspiration from Peter about patience. Even on that Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Peter got to slicing and dicing. He wasn't patient in that moment. But he learned patience as he reflected on the life of Jesus. Jesus came back for those 40 days to teach them. He was a part of that group being taught. That helped him. And as we'll see as we go through Acts, we'll see that Peter did learn. Peter was changed and transformed over time. So again, this is a process. But listen to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. 
But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. There it is. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That's God the Father. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. That is... If Jesus could deal with it and we have access not only to Jesus, but his Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can respond similarly. We're going to deal with some unjust suffering. People are going to say to us some stuff to us they shouldn't say, how they shouldn't say it. People are going to, to judge us. People are going to accuse us. And if we hang out with Jesus by hanging out with his words, we'll be able to respond faithfully and appropriately, right times, know what to say, when not to say, and we'll be okay when somebody thinks they're right and they're wrong. We won't, we won't as we said, with peace. We'll have peace and we won't go to pieces. So again, if Peter said that, and we know some of the story of Peter, we're going to get to know some more of the story of Peter. Peter learned that violence and a hot temper and all of that was not the response. He learned that patience was a response. Peace was a response. To always have joy, to, to be loving. And all of the fruit of the Spirit we're going to give, we start with kindness next week we get to. That's what Peter learned. Peter was changed and transformed. And so you and I have that same opportunity to be changed and transformed. The last section is patience and Christian suffering. Christian living, excuse me. There's a parable in Matthew 18 uh, that's there, but let me go to, let's go to James chapter 1. Read that Matthew 18 uh, sometime today, but I do want to read James. Uh, we know James was the, the uh, biological brother of Jesus. He was Mary and Joseph's son. So was Jude. We have a book of Jude that was also Jesus' brother. But listen to uh, what he says. I'm not going to read the entire passage. Entire passage is 19 to 27. And then also chapter 5, 7, and 12 speaks to uh, this, this endurance we can have. But I want to make sure we get to, to uh, long-suffering and forbearance where we mentioned above. But listen to what James says. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. There it is again. Slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, again, anger in and of itself is not a sin. What we do with our anger can be, and of course, if we let anger fester and we don't try to channel it faithfully and positively, we know what can happen. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in the mirror and after looking at themselves, goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. That is, you see all that, you get up and you see all that crust in your eyes and around your mouth and waking up and, you know, ladies, you got your bonnet on, whether it's the big bonnet or the regular size bonnet, you know, got all the prints on it, you know, and you just say, you know what? I see what I look like, but I don't need much care. I'm going to go out the house looking like I'm looking, um, and I'm, I'm going to leave that there so I don't get in any more trouble. But that's what he's saying there. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, that is being doers of the word, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
get scripture in us, the Holy Spirit will come out. And that religion there in English is not the same way that we look at religion. It talks about that Christianity is a relationship. It is, it is not a religion because it's based on having a relationship with God, and then that informs our lives. We also know that James is a place where he says, consider it pure joy. We looked at that last week about what we suffer. Long-suffering, you see this definition here of endurance of persecution. The easy way to remember long-suffering, long-suffering is suffering long. That's long-term patience. There will be times that we know that we have the right information. The right information is scripture. We know we, we have the right approach, and yet people may not agree with it. People may not support us. People may not uh, agree with us. But we know it and we can be settled. We can be, we can be at peace with our patients. And we are not going to, going to lash out and respond unfaithfully. That is what that is, suffering long. There may be some people that we never know ourselves understand God's perspective, understand the right approach to whatever the area of life is. That may happen. That's also not our place. And I can be open and transparent with you. I'm not always excited about that. I like people to know when I'm right. I like to know that people have realized that I was right. But that is not right of me. And I, I'm glad that God has shown that to me. And I've accepted that. And when I have those moments, I ask God for forgiveness. And I'm having them less and less. So I'm grateful that God is continuing to mature me in that sense. But that is long-suffering. Suffering long. Psalm 33 is an example of that. Please read that uh, in your time. But when we suffer, and that, that could be physical suffering, there are Christians across this world that are suffering physically. We suffer emotionally. We may suffer uh, uh, in our careers for obeying God. We may suffer sometimes in our family. Pastor Tony Evans gives an example about his father who was a Christian and for the first 10 years of his marriage to his mother, uh, his mother heckled, heckled his father and told him that he was dumb for being a Christian and he was stupid and called him some other names. But then she saw how he was living. She saw his dedication to fruit of the spirit. She even saw how it was positively affecting their kids. And God used that to save her and their marriage. And they have, they, not only were they blessed for that, but their children, their grandchildren and all that. Tony Evans is one of the uh, most well-known well preachers across the planet. And he credits his father's faith in informing that and his, his parents' marriage and how that happened, not only informing his marriage and his life and his parenting, but also the way he pastors, the way he preaches and teaches. So again, this suffering long has benefits and that will be where we close. But there should be no surprise when we suffer because the Bible, as we've talked about, tells us over and over again that it's when we suffer, not if we suffer. When we deal with some challenges of life, not if. We should also have no retaliation. Follow the example of Christ who did not fight back, not even in words, when Jesus could have called an army of hundreds of thousands of angels. And we also will not quit. We are committed and we are in this for the rest of our lives. Uh, there are some other scripture reference there. Uh, please read those in your leisure. And then we have forbearance. That is forgiveness of each other. Bible tells us that if we want to be forgiven, then we should forgive others. We're going to be done wrong to, and we should always forgive people when they do wrong to us. Sometimes it does take time to forgive people, and there's nothing wrong with that. Forgiveness also does not mean that we necessarily Go back to the relationship as it could have been or should have been, nor does it mean that we go back uh, to how the relationship was. Forgiveness is more about us, number one, internally letting go of any negative feelings we have towards a person, any negative thoughts we have to a person, uh, so that if we run into them, we don't have to go the other way and all of that. But depending upon what we are forgiving that person for, wisdom suggests even faithful application of scripture suggests we may not need to go right back into whatever that uh, previous relationship was, the previous circumstance was. But we should never harbor any negative feelings toward a person and, and thoughts towards a person. And again, that does take time. It can take a long time, but 
we should always get there because the Bible is clear when it says that to, it says we want God to forgive us for our sins. And now that's what's interesting is that we always want God to forgive us immediately for our sins. We always want other people to forgive us immediately for our sins. And so we should put that into practice of trying to as quickly as possible forgive other people. Again, it can take time, uh, but it should not be forever that we don't forgive people. And there are four scripture references that talks about the imperative that we forgive other people as God not only has forgiven us, but continues to forgive us. And then there are benefits. Psalm 40 is an example. We have several Proverbs that are examples about forgiveness. Uh, and all of those speak to these last three bullet points, the benefits of, of patience, is that we have the ability to influence others for God. Think about those times where you have been patient. You know, I asked at the beginning for you to comment about whether or not you're patient. And all of us essentially said we have to work on it. I have to work on it too. And so the benefit is we have the ability to influence others for God. If we're patient, we think about those moments we have been patient. That has created a different level of credibility and influence with other people. We know there are often times even uh, that that patience uh, irks people because we're not giving them the response that, they're, that they want. But typically they'll come around and be grateful that we didn't respond to them the way in which they respond. Even we're grateful that we didn't respond the way they wanted us to because we probably know that we can crush people if we need to. You know, you know, they, they, it's another Tupac reference. He said, I, I'm not a killer, but don't push me. And people will push you. But we have to, we have to be, we have to cultivate this patience and the rest of the fruit of the spirit uh, that we don't, we don't allow people to, to push our buttons and we go off. People going to push your buttons. People going to push our buttons. But we don't have to let people push them to the point that we go off. Okay. And so it's the ability to influence others for God. And that comes through those responses. It also is the certainty of God's blessings. Throughout the Bible, blessings and obedience hang out together. As we cultivate our relationship with God, a blessing of it is going to be the experience of the fruit of the Spirit ourselves and more importantly for other people. But then we're also promised is that if we do that, if we obey God, then there are other blessings that will come with it. And, and, and then we know the definition of a blessing is that we are enjoying and extending the goodness of God to other people. We know we feel great when we see other people thriving. We three other, other see other people's lives getting better. And we feel 10 feet tall when someone tells us that we have been a part of their life becoming better, of their relationship with God becoming better, their relationship with God thriving. And so there's a certainty of God's blessing when we're patient, but also when we are cultivating our relationship with God in such a way that we experience the fruit of the Spirit, and therefore other people also experience the fruit of God's Spirit through us. And it's also hope that sustains us even in the darkest times. We're in a dark time now, and those of us who have been connected to God and stay connected to God, it has been challenging at the same time uh, we're not going to pieces because of our relationship with God and all glory to God. We can't, we can't take the credit for where we are and how we've been and God keeping us mentally, physically, and otherwise. We have to give that glory to God because it's all about his Holy Spirit being inside of us and him connect to us. The responsibility that we have is to stay connected to him too, to talk to him. That's reading his word to listen to him more than we talk to him because we have two ears. That's staying in his word, staying connected to each other, giving each other life biblically, experiencing God. That's about, that's what this fruit of spirit is about. It's hope that sustains us in the darkest times and that can also inform our patience. So here's our statement of summation. Again, we have that responsibility. We've been held accountable for continuing to stay connected to God. And we're always going to experience the benefits of the fruit of the spirit and the certainty of those blessings we just talked about. Here's a final statement of summation and we're done for today. Keep waiting while you work on what you can. Keep waiting while you work on what you can. I always share this phrase that was shared with me by one of my seminary professors. We were concerned about all of the work in seminary and 
They told us how much reading we needed to be to do to be successful in class. And we were intimidated. And he could tell that we needed this word of comfort. It was Dr. Graham Mazzai. I never forget it, sitting at that table. He said, listen, you do your best and trust God to do the rest. That's all we can do at the end of the day. We do our best. We read our Bible. We read the devotional. We, we pray. We listen to God more than we talk to God. We talk to God open and honestly. That's why we're reading those Psalms. You know, we, we, we stay connected with Bible study. We stay connected on Sunday morning. We, we pray on a daily basis, read our Bible on a daily basis. Yes, we do all of that. But at the end of the day, we have to realize that it's more about God and not just say it and tweet it and post it on Facebook, but genuinely mean it in our hearts. We do our best and we trust God to do the rest. And that is how we'll experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, We'll be generous. We'll be faithful in all of the fruit of the spirit that we have in this cluster. So keep waiting while you work on what you can. All of us can admit, like we said at the beginning, we got to work on this with our patience. We have to be intentional about cultivating all of these uh, ways that patience can be increased. You got to be patient with people. You got to be patient with the community. But that does not absolve us from the work that we're doing. But we work and we do our best, but we're patient that God is going to do what only God can do. And then we always make sure we give God all the glory, honor, and praise that God is due. So keep waiting while you work on what you can. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't take it for granted that you join us. Thank you for your engagement. I see all your comments. I'll go back and respond to them uh, later on. I invite you to join us. Uh, number one, on Saturday, our district has a winter workshop, and they've blessed me with the opportunity to uh, lecture about food justice, something that is near and dear to my heart. So we invite you to join it. We're going to post that information again on social media tomorrow. Uh, you can also call the church office to get the Zoom information. Uh, we also, as always, enjoy invite you to join us on Sunday at noon as we continue our sermon series on the book of Acts called a model church learning what the early church did did do didn't do so we can discern the church that god wants us to be as a part of the body of christ again thank you so much for joining us i love you stay safe and we'll see you on saturday at 10 sunday at noon have a great rest of today go get your salt and stuff because the snow is coming so your driveway can be right and uh, be safe only go out if you need to if you do go out Stay more than six feet away from people with your mask on. Over your nose, too. I see some of y'all with it just over your mouth. Put it over your nose, too. All right. I love you. Have a great rest of today. Great weekend. Talk to you soon.